uh, most State of the Union responses end in disaster, whether it's uh, Marco Rubio in the water or Bobby Jindo talking to America like they're all children. But uh, Nikki Haley kind of stole the show last night and used her 10 minutes uh, rebuttal to kind of criticize both Obama and Trump. I don't think I've ever seen, you know, a, a person blast their own party in the, their party's State of the Union response. The Republicans are kind of turning on themselves now, but do you think it was wise for the GOP to slam Trump at the risk of alienating, not just Trump, Cruz as well, and, you know, at the risk of alienating the half of their voters that support them, Eric? I'd argue it was a risky move, but I think it shows that there's a very strong fracture right now in the Republican Party between the crazy side of Cruz and Trump and then the more moderate candidates like Mark Rubio or Jeb Bush, who are, you know, more close to the establishment brand. Um, so I think by doing that, she's trying to point out that don't – like, I think her exact quote is something like, don't listen to the loudest mouth, referring to Trump, because obviously all he ever does is blab on. But uh, I know it, it's interesting that she did that. I think maybe she's trying to push some sway towards Rubio and Bush. Whether it'll be effective or not, who knows? I don't think so, because based on what Trump has already said and the fact that he's stayed at the top of the polls all this time shows that most voters don't actually care if he says controversial things. Um, that water's already been tested. I think for Trump at this point, the only way he collapses is if he really chooses to. I think he'll just keep pushing forward and build the announce. I mean, the different political commentators like Ann Coulter, who I absolutely detest, came out and dismissed it. There's been other ones in the media you know, dismissing what Haley said. Some supporting it, but I think more are dismissing her. Well, dismissing it is putting it lightly. Ann Coulter said that Trump should deport Nikki Haley. Deporter, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, what, did you make, what did you make of her decision to go after her own party as well as the Democrats last night? Well, it was her decision. That's remarkable, and that's awesome. But I definitely think she did it with the blessing of Reince Priebus and the, the GOP National Committee, um, or the RNC, I mean, um, because and I think that that's, that wasn't a message to Republicans. Um, that was a message to everyone else for the general election coming up. Um, and I, I, I think that they were, they're trying to establish, um, that the nominee is not going to be Trump because I, I really do think that once the votes start being cast and once we get past the anomaly states of Iowa, uh, New Hampshire and South Carolina. And I mean that they're anomalies in just by virtue of the fact that they've been first for so long. Um, you know, they are now the first states where voting happens, not states that are representative of the country as a whole. Um, but once the actual voting happens, I would be shocked if Trump starts winning elections, especially, especially towards the end of the uh, primary when the, ironically, the states that won't matter in the general election, like New York, California, uh, places like that, vote. And I, I know that they, um, I know that that's where the establishment base, the establishment feels that their base is the strongest. So I don't think it'll come down to, um, you know, Trump being the nominee, and I don't think the RNC does either, and I think that's why they were trying to say that, you know, we are a party of rational, quiet thought and people who make stuff happen and do unpopular things. I thought it was really smart that Nikki Haley talked about Charleston and the Confederate flag, because a huge issue that conservatives lost, but she delivered it like it was a victory, and that I think is uh, it's what the RNC wants people to associate republicanism with, not Trump or Cruz or the sideshow. Well, Although the sideshow years. We've kind of seen this party cannibalization before, right? You know, the, the Republican establishment trying to push back against the Tea Party during their rise, and then most of the establishment candidates that push back hard has got their asses handed to them, and we saw a Tea Party <laughs> wave swing. Do you think that the establishment <laughs> risks that, like alienating those voters, and then they're going to pay for it when it's not just the presidential election? There's a lot of Republican seats up for grabs this coming uh, election. Peter, who is that directed at? Sorry. Oh. <laughs> to, I'm sorry. 
Oh, what did I, you, how much of that did you miss? Well, I think the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if it was directed to me. I was listening to Josh work through his uh, tuberculosis issue. Sorry, guys, there. I've not, I've been sick. And, uh, but, um, no, I, I mean, I think, you know, you raise valid points and there, there's a lot of risk. I mean, Nikki Haley was, was not speaking against her own party per se. She was speaking against Donald Trump. Who the mainstream Republican Party is is absolutely, I think, terrified well, between, of. Between Trump and Cruz, who pretty much represent the same people, more or less, that's half the Republican electorate. Sure. I mean, the difference with Cruz, though, is he's not independently wealthy. And so the RNC has the money stick that they can use at some point to bring him into line. That whole Republican machine can be extended or withheld as necessary, and that's very critical for every candidate except Donald Trump, who's spending his, his, mostly his own money. Um, and that, that's frightening. The other thing about Trump is, as everyone has been at, so far wrongly predicting, including uh, me, I mean, the expectation is at some point he's going to implode. He's going to say something that's so far off the, the, the grid that he's going to crumble, that Something will just happen that's so outrageous that people realize he's a clown and, and, and walk away from him. I mean, that's the GOP's real fear. I don't think fear. it's they're implode they're... anymore. Mm. I think it's yeah, more like they're just we're waiting anything. to see if people vote for him. Like, yeah, he's not going to implode because people are entertained. You know, he, he asked the question, are you not entertained? And we said, you're goddamn right we are. And and so he's going to be around, but it's if he's, if he starts winning elections – that's when everyone is going to shit their pants, myself yeah. included. There's no question. Because, I mean, he's, he's too much of a loose cannon for the Republicans, especially, you know, he's going to be running against, you know, the, the human political robot, Hillary Clinton, um, who, who doesn't make mistakes, who doesn't make outland, I mean, other than her entire life outside of the campaign. But, I mean, and the idea is she doesn't have gaffes. She doesn't say crazy things. She's always got her talking points. Um, she's going to look very she's presidential. A she's a pro. She's going to well, – she's she, been running for president since 1980 or something. But, I mean, the idea <laughs> is, is that when it gets – Yeah, I mean, when it gets down to Hillary on a stage next to Trump, he's going to look like drunk uncle – um, and she's going to look very presidential. And I think that scares the hell, as you said, out of the Republicans. And they need to kind of finish the Trump thing up uh, before they have to nominate a candidate. Um, and, you know, they, they have, what, eight months to do that, something like that? If Clinton wins, I don't know, Sanders is gaining. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a no, second. Uh, but <laughs> Nikki Haley, one of the reasons Nikki Haley was picked to do the response is because her name has been constantly floated out there as a potential vice presidential pick for whoever wins the nomination. Josh, who's going to pick her, though, when you look at the people that really have a chance at it? Um, I think anyone who wants to be competitive, for some reason, Bernie Sanders does become the nominee or Martin O'Malley. Let's not, you know, throw him wow. off the stage just yet. Down. Come on. Uh, all right, that was kind of me. I'm sorry. Um, but again, if it's if it's a man that uh, is the nominee, then the VP field for Republicans is wide open. But if it's Hillary Clinton, they absolutely will have to nominate a woman as their VP. And um, Nikki, and so that's why I think, huh? What other female candidates exist among the Republican pool? Are there any other prominent ones? Oh, I mean, Kathy Morris, Rod, none, Kathy that, Morris none that would want to be VP, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. I mean, it would probably actually be one of those, like, maybe representative from a state out west. Um, because especially if your establishment guy wins, Marco Rubio uh, is, I think, the smart pick for like the establishment sort of choice and i think he'd be a dangerous candidate too like marco rubio but he's struggling again um but i do think that uh they'll need someone to to bolster up their tea party freedom caucus cred and so it'll probably be you know uh someone from basically another person It'll be another Palin, but hopefully one who's better. 
Yeah, they've got to have a way to attack Hillary. Um, if she can play the, you know, you're saying that because I'm a woman, that's sexist, whatever. Um, every time a Republican male criticizes her, um, she's got a very powerful tool there. If they can get someone on the ticket, a, a woman, who can go after Hillary and be immune from that type of thing, that's a very powerful draw. Um, I think Carly Fiorona was supposed to play something of that role, but she turned out to be a complete blithering idiot um, and you know, was of no, no real value. I, but I'd think, go with Crank. I'd go with Crank, Peter, and have a little decorum. She's <laughs> Yeah, okay, all right. She's like, yeah, you know, but, um, you know, Nikki Haley is, is smart. She's, uh, plays well on TV. She's mediagenic. Um, she's handled some oh, things uh, in her state pretty well. Um, you know, I think she was running for vice president last night as much as anything. Um, and she did a good job of it. Oh, great. But I mean, you know, Josh keeps coming back to Rubio, but at what point are his numbers going to budge that we re- that he actually yeah. makes a real dent? In, I mean, what nine, ten percent of the of the voters are for Rubio? What about the other ninety that want nothing to do with him? And so when it comes down to it, you're really looking at a race between Trump and Cruz right now, and how are one of them going to pick her when she pretty much slammed their immigration rhetoric and race rhetoric last night? Josh, Peter. Okay, I, I, I didn't know if that was direct what you made, but, well, all right, so, you're right about, uh, Rubio's numbers, but again, I do think that because one of the best things that I've noticed about sort of election data is that the stuff, the, the stuff where they figure out what happened usually comes after the election. And we never had a campaign like this before with a figure like Trump in it, so, I just, I don't know if the opinion polls are, uh, you know, as reliable as they've been in, in, in previous. Um, you know, we'll see in the weeks leading up to the Iowa caucus, uh, if things don't start switching then, then yeah, the polls have probably been right and, uh, Trump or Cruz will be the nominee. But again, if, if Rubio, if Rubio comes in second in Iowa and second in New Hampshire, he is now competitive in South Carolina and the media will treat him accordingly. Yeah. You know? That's very important because this is, this election is gonna, the, the general election as well as these primaries is gonna hinge significantly on candidates turning out their, their voters. Um, Hillary too. I mean, even when she, even if she becomes the nominee, and I need to state for the record, that, you know, I would give up a kidney to see her drop out of this race. Um, but even when it comes, I mean, if, if the Democratic voters get the impression that, you know, she's going to be a shoe in a lot of them are going to stay home. You've got to rally the, the, the voters to get out there. The question is, you know, can Trump do that? The Iowa and New Hampshire tend to have a pretty high turnout. I mean, people there are, are into this process. And, and so, in, a, in yet another way, are completely unrepresentative of, of, you know, America at large. But I think Josh is right. As we start to get a little deeper into this, um, turning people, turning voters out, getting them to actually get up in the morning and go to the poll and vote for you is going to be a challenge. People have said Trump lacks the organization, the on-the-ground organization, to, to get that done. Um, you've got to go knock on doors. You've got to hand out things. You've got to get churches to run vans and pick up their parishioners. Um, you've got to have volunteers everywhere to pull folks in on a local level, literally one at a time if necessary. Um, it takes a very big, very data-driven organization. Hillary certainly got one. Um, the Republican National Committee has something they can help with, but whether Trump is going to benefit from that in the primaries, I'm not certain that's going to, going to be there.